Welcome to the HJ Talks About Abuse podcast, the podcast where we talk about sexual abuse cases in the hope that it will assist listeners in openly discussing topics which have been ignored for too long. This podcast is brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. We are lawyers, so we tend to speak about the legal aspects of abuse cases, but we aren't too shy to speak up about the broader issues faced by survivors of sexual abuse too. We hope that you find it interesting, but more than that, if you are a survivor of sexual abuse, we hope that you find our discussion empowering. This is the podcast that is brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. My name is Alan Collins. I am the partner who heads up the abuse team at Hugh James, and I'm joined by my colleague, Felina Grosvenor. Hi, Felina. Hi, Alan. In this podcast, we are going to be discussing potential civil liability when there is child abuse outside of the home. And we're going to be looking at two particular cases where there is abuse abroad and at school. So the backdrop to this is what has been reported in the media recently concerning two recent child abuse cases, which could possibly give rise to civil liability. The first case relates to the abuse by a British subject against children in the Philippines, and the other case relates to a teaching assistant and a pupil. So the first case that we're going to look at is the recent conviction of Mark Page, a former BBC Radio 1 disc jockey. So, Felina, can you give us some of the background? Thank you, Alan. Yes. So thank you for that introduction. Mr Page was, as you've said, working for the BBC and he was a, well, formerly, and he was a stadium announcer for some 20 years. He worked as a managing director of Armed Forces Radio Station Garrison FM and this gave him a reason to travel to the Philippines as it was part of his role. And it's been alleged by the media that he used this role to meet young children. It was a cover, so to speak. And he has been found guilty of using his webcam whilst in the UK to contact people in the Philippines to arrange to commit serious sexual abuse. And he's also been found guilty of travelling to the Philippines and committing offences whilst in the Philippines. And these were said to have happened in 2016 and 2019. So he was a kind of sex tourist, to use the, the jargon that is sometimes used in the media. So he here he is, a British national. He's got the technology at home, which he then misuses in order to access vulnerable youngsters out in the Philippines and he travels out to the Philippines where he sexually abuses them. Yes, yeah, so as far as we know, it's it's just the Philippines. Obviously, we, we can't say if, if there's any other countries involved, but we do know for a fact there's a significant amount of premeditation to this. It was webcam conversations whilst in the UK making proper arrangements. We do know, and as has been reported in the media, that he tried to actually haggle down the price for sexual encounters you know and for our terms it was not expensive in in the first place so it's really quite shocking the amount of premeditation that's gone into this and of course he is taking advantage or was taking advantage given that he's been convicted of particularly vulnerable young people children are obviously vulnerable by virtue of being children but these are particularly vulnerable because so many children and young people in the Philippines live in poverty, if not abject poverty. Therefore, the prospect of money is particularly appealing. And also, I don't know if this was the case here, the parents of children are tempted to allow their children to be abused in return for money. You know, it's a shocking. So on, on that, Alan, it was actually, so the reference I just made to him haggling the price, that was with the mother of a 13-year-old boy and, I believe, a 12-year-old girl. I think she was the mother of both. Um, Because, as you've said, the poverty gives rise to being able to control these people with money. And it is estimated that around 60,000 children in the Philippines have been forced into prostitution as a way of their family surviving. The case, of course, is an example of the fact that UK law 
has an extensive breach. This man was prosecuted for committing serious offences on the other side of the world. Yes, could you explain to us really how that, maybe how that would have come about? Well, we don't know, or I don't know, how matters actually came to light, but obviously they did, which enabled the the police here in the UK and the Crown Prosecution Service to successfully prosecute Page. Is it a factor that the webcam that was coming from the UK? Could be. It, it could well be that he was detected through, you know, the activity generated by going online. Obviously, yeah. we've covered this in previous podcasts, the fact that, you know, we've got the dark web and how the internet and social media is effectively corrupted in order to commit serious criminal offences, and in this case, serious sexual offences involving children. So one way or the other, I suspect he left a trail which enabled him to be followed and led to a successful police investigation and prosecution. And of course, the legislation does enable a prosecution to be brought here, even though the offences are committed outside the jurisdiction, a legal term obviously, but in other words, in another country, in this case, the Philippines. And of course, it's only part of the story, isn't it? You know, I I don't know what the victims feel about Page being prosecuted and sent to prison and so on. One imagines that they feel that justice to a degree has now been served, but for them, they continue to live with the ongoing consequences of what this man's gone and done to them. And there may actually be another avenue. So we've mentioned the criminal side of things that has actually been successful. And we do hope that that has given these people an element of justice. But there is potential for a civil claim to be brought after the fact of the criminal conviction. Could you explain that to us? Yes. So there's a couple of points to be made. I don't know why the criminal court did not make a compensation order because criminal courts, when sentencing, are supposed to consider compensation for the victim. Why that hasn't happened here, I don't know. But leaving that to one side, it is always open to victims to pursue their abuser or those responsible for the abuser for compensation for the pain and damage that they have suffered as a result of the abuse. And we must remember that there is, for example, the European Convention in respect of compensation, which basically says that governments and states should ensure that victims should be compensated. So it's recognised as a a sort of legal, and I would say international, right or obligation to ensure that victims are compensated. And that probably explains, to a certain extent, why there are, for example, criminal injuries compensation schemes and Crown Courts and Magistrates Courts are meant to make compensation orders, even though it seems, for reasons that are hard to fathom, often that that doesn't happen. So there is that legal right for victims to achieve for them what might be complete Mm -hmm. justice by seeking compensation. And of course, you and I have worked on a case, again, another Filipino case, have we not, yes. where we have obtained compensation for victims in the Philippines who were compensated by a British national. I think it's worth saying that that case that we worked on, the conviction was actually in the Philippines. And whereas this one is in the criminal courts in the UK. And so you can see how a civil case could be brought. You know, the abuser is in the UK. The conviction has been obtained in the UK. And you would think that a civil case could be brought. But the case that we previously worked on, that was actually a conviction in the Philippines. But we were able to secure a civil claim in the UK. Well, that's right. So, you know, you can, in certain circumstances, everything's got to sort of stack up as such. You've got to have someone to be to bring a claim against. The claim has to be viable. So what we look at in these circumstances is the practicalities. Who was responsible for the abuse? Is there a viable case? And over the years, we've had a number of cases where we have been able to successfully secure compensation for victims who live literally on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. And that can have very important practical consequences for them. It's not just about obtaining a sum of money. Quite often, it can be a sum of money that is used to pay for an education or to pay for setting up a livelihood. Yes. You know, he's represented 
victims who, as a result of the abuse, fell out of education. Mm. And often there's no sort of social security system, no sort of welfare system. So they are very dependent on scratching a living really at the bottom of the heap, if I can put it like that. And I can remember in one case where the compensation was used to enable the young person concerned to set up their own moped work. Oh, really? And so they were able to um, make a living. And I think of another case where the young person concerned was able to secure a plot of land in order to grow her own food in order to support her own family. So, you know, I think we shouldn't always look at these things through necessarily comfortable Western eyes and thinking, oh, you know, here's a check. Let's put it in the bank. Let's go and do this that, or the other. We need to look at these things from a, a survivor perspective. That's really nice to hear. And as you said, yes, it, it widens sort of your understanding of how beneficial the result can be, even if it is, you know, a fairly low amount, you know, depending on the circumstances, it can really change a life. Mm-hmm. So for people listening who perhaps work with individuals in other countries or work with survivors, what are they looking for to see if they perhaps have a civil case to bring? Is it the fact that they've reported matters to the police or does there need to be a conviction? I don't think it's, it's always necessary to have a conviction. I think we always have to remember at the end of the day, we may have to go to court and prove our case. Lots of these cases don't actually end up going to trial. It's quite unusual for a case to end up going to trial. Most cases, if they're viable, are settled between the parties and agreement is reached. So really then, if this has happened, it's just best for whoever's involved to ask for some advice because it may not be the fact that you have to have secured a conviction. We will just look at the evidence that we do have and advise you accordingly. That's right. So that the victim or those looking after the victim can make an informed decision as to what is best for them. It's a very individual position at the end of the day that they have to think about. Uh, And our job is to make sure that they have all the information that they need to make an informed decision as to whether they wish to pursue the case. That's right. But I suppose if the abuser is a British citizen... And if there is a conviction, then definitely get in touch. Yes, but I, but I think in all cases, get in touch. Mm. Because what you might think is impossible might turn out to be possible and vice versa. I think it's yes. always a good idea to get expert legal advice in these situations regardless so that you know exactly where you stand and then you can make a decision as to what you want to do. I agree. And I think that probably will be the conclusions on the next case. We are going to talk about the teacher case, I think. Yes. So this is a case against a woman named Hannah Harris, who was a teaching assistant. And she's been found guilty of having sex with a child, a boy who was aged 14 years old at the time. Can I stop you there? And I don't don't wish to interrupt unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. But I did a podcast very recently with Professor Michael Salter, Professor of Criminology at the University of New South Wales. And we we're talking about the fact that in the media, it doesn't, it doesn't have to necessarily be the tabloid media, media generally, they go and say, teacher's been found guilty of having sex with pupil, in this case, a 14-year-old boy. Actually, it's misleading, isn't it? Because the teacher wasn't having sex with the boy. The teacher was actually sexually abusing a child. Because, right, Alan, we've addressed yeah. this ourselves as well, the terminology, yeah. and it, it is yeah. sort of forgiving when it shouldn't be. Yeah. So I interrupted you, but I thought, oh, no, 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 no. You know, we, need, we, need to, we need to make the point here that, you know, we can easily pick up on other people's language. And actually, we shouldn't be doing that because it's, yeah. it's wrong. No, thank you, Alan. I mean, I work in the industry and for me not to notice, it's it shows how it's so subconscious. You don't think about it when you are sort of being a bit forgiving. So let me rephrase. So Miss Harris was sexually assaulting. She was raping a child of 14 years old who was a pupil at the school where she was teaching as a teaching assistant. And we we touched upon the premeditation of the first case, and this really is part of this one as well. Miss Harris created a fictional story 
so that she could actually have contact with the boy's parents, you know, excuse his being with her by saying that her daughter was the boy's girlfriend. So that just shows that she knew that she needed some form of excuse to be with him. It was completely wrong. And I'm sure that that gave his parents a lot more distress. Quite. She was convicted of what offences exactly? I'm looking for example at the BBC News website, where they again, they go and say, Hodgson teaching assistant convicted of sex with pupil 14, and teaching assistant has been found guilty of having sex with a 14-year-old pupil in a supermarket car park. Again, you know, it's a serious case, and she's been told, I don't know if she's actually been sentenced yet. Because... It's six years imprisonment. Right, okay. And she was prosecuted, it seems, for four charges of sexual activity with a child in December 2019 and January 2020. Yes, and, and she was yeah. cleared of three. Yeah, so she was found guilty of one count, and this is in respect of whatever it was that took place in the supermarket. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So again, language is extremely important because it should always be accurate, particularly when you're when we're dealing with serious and sensitive subjects such as this. But again, mm-hmm. it's a case, isn't it, of someone using their position to access and to groom. Yes. Yeah, so on that, Alan, I think we can safely say from the facts that the the grooming must or the relationship, you know, not that I would like to call it a relationship but friendship or however this began would have begun at school. That's how she's met him. And there clearly have been matters outside of school with the reference to a supermarket car park. So the the abusive position really has begun at the school and it's given her so much access to him, you know, inside and outside of school. Yes. And again, it's, it's a classic example like the Page case of using positions that they've achieved or acquired as vehicles to getting to these children. And of course, it has consequences, as in this particular case, potentially for the employer. Whoever employed Miss Harris, they may find themselves vicariously liable for the abuse that she perpetrated. It's a classic employment situation. Employers are responsible for the sins and misdeeds of their employees, hence the term vicarious liability. Mm. And on that, Alan, would the school only be liable? I know that obviously this is quite a specific case, but maybe we could talk generally. Would the school be liable only for the actions that took place on school property? Or would there be a case for the matters that also took place outside of school premises? I think depending on the facts, what took place outside school, because it is the role as teacher that Mm -hmm. enabled, as I understand it, the defendant to abuse her pupil. So provided there isn't some very definitive demarcation, I would say on current case law, the authority, local authority or whoever the employer was, would be vicariously liable for all of it because it's all closely connected. Yes. And she remained as a teaching assistant, as far as we know, throughout the whole time. And he was a pupil at the school throughout the whole time that the abuse took place, as far as as far as we're aware. Exactly. And again, it's a case where in these unfortunate and tragic circumstances, legal advice is necessary because in some cases it may not be possible to bring a case, but in other cases it would be possible. Again, we look at the practicalities, the viability of a potential case and advise accordingly so that people can make an informed decision as to what they want to do. Yes. So for those listening, as we said before, there doesn't necessarily have to be a conviction. There doesn't necessarily have to have been the police investigation already. We're able to give you advice very early on in the process. And if they feel that there's a situation where an employer is involved, you know, it may not be a school setting, it may be in the workplace, that they should get in touch. Exactly. Thank you very much, Felina. Thank you for suggesting these cases for this podcast. Much appreciated. And as always, those listening, if you have any thoughts, questions or ideas as to what you would like to hear in a future podcast, 
please do get in touch. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of HJ Talks About Abuse. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you'd like to speak to us about something you've heard today, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at aboutabuse at hjtalks.co.uk.